You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. This episode of the cycling podcast at Femina was recorded a few days before we all heard of the death of Sharon Laws, the former Olympian and British champion who died from cervical cancer. Sharon was only 43. I met her at La Course in Marseille earlier this year. And as so many people who know her well are saying, I find her to be incredibly warm with a wonderful, lively spirit and absolutely passionate about cycling. Sharon will be and already is dearly missed in the cycling community. Our thoughts are with Sharon's family. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I am with, once again, Orla Shinoui. Hello, Richard. For episode something, insert number here, of the cycling <laughs> podcast Femina, December. We're into December. We are indeed, year. I know. You skipped a month, Orla. Are you feeling a bit out of, out of the loop? Yeah, I was left out for a month. Mm. I was just saying, just, actually. Just thought we'd bench you. <laughs> it's the budget, think, you know? It's, yeah, the it's budget, because I'm so costly. <laughs> I think we'd done so much though. We'd had the um, the West End show. We had the second podcast dinner the next day. And I think for the sake of our friendship, you decided, you know what, let's keep a bit of distance for the rest of November, Orla. See you in December. I'd had enough of you by yeah. that yeah. point. <laughs> the uh, feeling definitely. was mutual, love. Last month, we heard from Hannah Barnes and Mika Kruger from a conversation that I had with them in Rafa, Manchester earlier this year. Hope you enjoyed it. A uh, month before that was Tiffany Cromwell. That's mm-hmm. when we were in Monaco, wasn't it? This month we are well. We're we're kind of reflecting on on the year and wishing a Merry Christmas. We'll get to all that, won't we? Oh yeah, we'll we'll, wish we'll, Merry we'll Christmas. announce. Although you probably know already, our peddlers to charm that which marks the launch, which should be imminently of the the range of peddlers to charm clothing. Rafa are producing that our main sponsor. If you I go, actually don't know who won. Oh, well, it's, well, the suspense must be killing you. You'll find out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you can get a, a Peddlers de Charme t-shirt in early December. If you go to the cyclingpodcast.com shop, it'll take you to the, our page on the Rafa website. And I think the, the jerseys are coming in, in January, so mm. keep an eye on that. We're going to talk mainly in this episode about sponsorship and about mm. how the women's teams some of the top teams are are funded and who funds them because a a big talking point always is why are there not more men's teams backing women's teams and it came out of our conversation with bob varney who runs drops i think where um you know he and others have pointed out that if all of the men's world tour teams had women's teams would there be space for a bulls dolmans or a drops or a wnt and we will hear from the the man behind bulls domas they've just extended their sponsorship actually of the team so they're carrying on for a couple more years at least and we'll hear from wnt which is a, a very interesting team company based in germany i was whisked off to germany to their sort of team bonding get make together it sound very glamorous go-karting, was it Ryanair? go-karting actually oh very good and uh you near well it was it was actually right on the austrian border but we'll get to that. We'll hear that about that in the final part. It was it was a really really fun couple of days. Uh, quite interesting. But Orla, you were you were working at the Ruler Classic recently as well, weren't you? Um, yeah. And you spoke to former UCI president. Yeah, Brian Cookson. When you said at the top of the episode that we were chatting about sponsorship, it's something that, as a topic itself, as a topic title, might sound very dry. But actually, as I found out post my interview with Brian Cookson creates an awful lot of debate, um, an awful lot of strong argument. Certainly on Twitter, I got myself embroiled in a bit of a um, a Twitter spat, I like to call it, off the back of Brian Cookson's announcement, which I tweeted out. And his announcement being, which I'm sure many of our listeners will be aware of by now, um, is that after being voted out of uh, the president's office at the UCI, he wants to start a new top tier women's team. So he wants to bring in big sponsors. He wants to make it as professional as possible. And so once he'd made that announcement on stage, I spoke to him backstage afterwards um, and here's what he had to say. Essentially, I'm at the beginning of my thinking on this and uh, it's almost, to call it an an announcement with a capital A is probably over it a bit. To be honest, what I'm saying now is that I think there's a fantastic opportunity out there at the moment for a top-level women's team to come along. Uh, I'm interested in trying to stimulate and uh, help make that happen. Uh, I'm talking to a number of organisations, companies, potential sponsors and so on about how we would make that happen in a year's time, in 2000. 
2019 season, uh, if all goes to plan, the UCI uh, is going to have a two-tier team structure for women's teams, so there'll be UCI Women's World Tour teams. There might only be a handful at the start, but what I'm saying is there's a fantastic opportunity out there now for a manufacturer of bikes and equipment, for a clothing manufacturer, for uh, a, a title sponsor perhaps from outside uh, of cycling, but somebody who wants to work with cycling to produce uh, a team that is not only uh, iconic in terms of its uh, achievements and success levels and gets to the very, very top. Uh, of women's cycling but also has a kind of uh, in-depth uh, link through to participation that can use the, the success of the elite level riders to motivate and inspire other women uh, to get involved in cycling uh, for their health, fitness, uh, enjoyment, fun and all the rest of it and I just think now uh, I've still got a little bit of currency if you like as, as a recent president of UCI. I think when I was president of UCI, we did a lot of good things that have helped women's cycling progress in terms of equalizing prize money at world championships, producing the women's world tour um, calendar and so on, and, and helped raise that standard. There's a long way to go. There are some things that I would have liked to have been able to do, like guarantee a minimum salary for women, but at the moment, the economy and size of women's cycling is not strong enough or hasn't been strong enough to support that. But I think now we're seeing quite quickly uh, an opportunity where there's a sea change in the media a sea change in the public's attitude to all women's sport not just cycling and I think that in the next uh, next year or so we've got the possibility of putting together something absolutely unique and special and driving that not just as I say at the elite level but as a uh, as a means of helping you know, our national federation, British Cycling, and maybe other national federations around the world to get more women involved in cycling. The ambitions sound very Sky esque, as I said on stage earlier, in terms of um, hoping to be the best team in the world, um, encouraging participation. That's certainly something that Team Sky used to do. Is that Team Sky model one that you would be hoping to follow or imitate in any way? Well, I think uh, there are many, many great qualities of Team Sky. Uh, it has set a new standard. Um, in some ways, it's a little different from the original ethos that the team had when when we helped establish it from British Cycling when I was the president there. But, you know, I'm not criticising anybody there. I think they've done a great job. They've taken it in the commercial and promotional direction that, that the sponsors wanted it to go, and, and that's, that's fine. I think they've made a mistake in not having a women's team, frankly, and I think that will be a simple thing that they could do to improve their public image. But, you know, they may or may not want to do that. And that's where I say that compulsion I don't think is the right way. If it doesn't work for a sponsor, for a team, then that, that's fine. If it doesn't work for an event organiser or, or their sponsors, that's fine. Find others. Let's try and help the women create uh, their own monuments, their own classics, uh, their own grand tours. That process is already underway. There are certain uh, well-known events that are uh, really high standard. Some of them are associated with men's events. Some of them are not. So what I'm saying is let's try now to uh, do with the teams what has happened with a number of the World Tour, Women's World Tour events, that they've all shifted to a higher standard under the impetus of the UCI. They have said, you know what, we can do a better job here. We want to try harder. We want to give the women the, um, the, the theatre that they deserve for their talents and skills. And I think, you know, there are some great teams out there already. And, you know, I, I wouldn't uh, criticise any, any of them and those people who are working really hard. But I think there's an opportunity now for someone else to come in and say, you know what, let's, let's not just have two or three teams that are, are capable of riding at a women's world tour level consistently and at a high standard throughout the year let's let's aim for five or six teams and i think you know there's a good opportunity uh there to do one that the you know and whilst i as i say whilst i've got some currency as a recent uci president people know who i am if i say this is something that 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 I'd like to help make happen, then I'm hoping that other people will come out of the woodwork and say, you know what, uh, we'd like to be part of this idea. So let's see what happens. So that was uh, former UCI President Brian Cookson speaking to you all at the Ruler Classic and revealing his plans to set up a women's pro team. Now, you sort of tweeted about it, didn't you? And I don't think the response was universally positive, surprisingly. <laughs> no, it certainly wasn't universally positive. In fact, there was barely a positive comment. 
um, which I was really surprised by because I thought Brian Cooks, and whatever you think of him as a man, whatever you think of him as he was as a president, has come out of the most important, um, influential role in uh, cycling. He's been in charge of every single part of it and looked at every single part of it. And he has thought, where is the future of cycling? It's in women's cycling. I thought that was a great reflection of women's cycling. And also bringing on board, as he wants to do, big sponsors as well into this team, which, which introduces more money into the sport, I thought could only be a good thing. However, a lot of the response I got on Twitter was that Brian Cookson shouldn't be trying to start a new team. I mean, categorically, they were, people were saying he shouldn't start a new team. Instead, he should be concentrating on introducing a minimum wage. And I think a lot of that obviously comes from Brian Cookson not introducing a minimum wage as president, but he is no longer president. Which was one of his manifesto pledges yeah. back then. I'm, I'm surprised with Orla to hear there was some negativity on Twitter. <laughs> of all media, I know. I mean, crazy. But, you know, people were quite vitriolic against Brian Cookson. And, and I think... In his defence, we do have to remember where women's cycling was when he came into office and where it is now. And yeah, he did have a strong manifesto in terms of women's cycling. He didn't deliver on everything. But surprise, surprise, leadership is about pragmatism, compromise, as well as trying to deliver to the best of your ability. And I think that as imperfect as the Women's World Tour is, it does still exist. And I think it's, it's much better than we had before. And I think we do have a better state of cycling. And I also don't see how trying to introduce uh, a new well-sponsored team can in any way be to the detriment of introducing a minimum wage. Surely introducing more money can only be a good thing. The more sponsors we have, the more high-profile people we have, uh, the more likely that we not only introduce the minimum wage, but that we start to pay the top riders a decent salary. Um, I know that it, that some of them are on, on good money, but what we'd like to see is more of that across the board. And for that, you do need extra money because where is the money for this um, minimum wage going to come from? And some comments that I got as well was that well if some of the bottom teams have to go by the wayside, if we have to have a two-tiered system in, in women's cycling, so be it the UCI are planning for exactly that in two years time and I think that probably two years time is a good time frame for it. If we were to do it straight away as some people seem to want to do, then you are cutting off a big old chunk of women's cycling. How many will be left at the top? That's the question. How many will be able to afford it? And will we see teams at the bottom tier then disappear completely because they don't have access to the very limited amount of television coverage, newspaper coverage that we've got even at the moment? And I think that we do unfortunately have to take stock and realise and remember that we do live in an unequal world, even still in 2017. And I do welcome men who are new to this cause, but having spent a lifetime being a woman, I know that we're not paid the same amount of money. We don't still have the same amount of power across the board that men do. So the question is not whether this is unfair but what can we do about it? And maybe let's stop comparing women's cycling to men's cycling and saying, well, in men's cycling, the riders don't have to do more. The teams don't have to do more than ride their bikes to get the money that they are owed. Let's just look at women's cycling as it is. And um, if we don't have a minimum wage, what can we do? Can we have teams more engaged with their sponsors? Can we have teams showing sponsors what they can bring in terms of brand ambassador ambassadorship, engagement in wellness programs? Can the riders do more with their social media or not more, just different things with their social media to become um, stronger ambassadors for the sponsors? Just are there ways that we can engage with the public more than we're doing at the moment and stop the comparison with men's cycling? And I would say one final thing, which is, and then I will step off my soapbox but um, for anyone who does sort of sit at home and, and, and shout about the need for a minimum wage by all means shout because the louder that becomes the more difficult it is to ignore however simply shouting alone will do nothing do something about it as well so you know if all you do is tell your friends how wonderful women's cycling is encourage one extra person to watch it to watch whatever recent highlights on youtube for example the more hits that you get for those highlights on youtube the more proof we have that there's an audience out there and the more likely it is that more sponsors will come in to the sport and then we'll have not only a minimum wage but better salaries across the board do you want a hand down there orla do you want to, uh, <laughs> it's quite yeah, high yeah. up here actually yeah yeah let me jump yeah yeah. Boom. <laughs> no, no, but what came out, of, and it's funny how a, a story like that can be hijacked by an issue like mm -hmm. the minimum wage, which is one of the, the flagship issues, I, I guess, for a lot of people who follow and support women's cycling. I don't really 
understand why it's such a, a priority when there's an awful lot else that needs to, to grow and develop, I think, before it becomes tenable. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because speaking to Tiffany Cromwell a couple of months ago when we went to see her, she felt the same. You know, her point about it was quite nuanced and it's very simplistic to say, you know, minimum wage will sort a lot of problems out. I, I think it would, it would also create some problems. And that's not to say that it wouldn't be a good thing. Of course, it would be a good thing. But, you know, the, the news of Brian Cookson's team got a little bit hijacked by that. Did you not then have a conversation, though? Because a lot of these people arguing over this thing are actually wanting the same thing, ultimately. Did you not then have a conversation with Catherine Bertin, who who was quite vocal in, in, in some of the points that she made to you? Yes, I did. And Catherine is is a brilliant advocate of women's cycling and progress in women's cycling. You know, she's very active in it. And I reached out to her on Twitter and asked if I could chat to her on the phone so we could talk things through. And we did have a brilliant conversation, which unfortunately was recorded, but that recording went um, astray somehow or other, her end, unfortunately. But I will hope to to repeat that in some way and, and have that chat for the cycling podcast because what was really interesting she had some brilliant points to make and I suspected on when I spoke to her on Twitter that we probably wanted the exact same thing or very close to the exact same thing um, you can almost hear a Belinda Carlisle song here which is <laughs> come on oh no we want the same thing I'm thinking Circle in the Sand. I was thinking, what's that got That's to do with it? That's not the one I was thinking of. <laughs> I don't know that one. You're I'm clearly, kind of, a, you're clearly bigger Belinda Carlyle fan than I'm, I am. Uh, anyway. I'm hijacking <laughs> this now, Belinda Carlyle. So anyway, I chatted to Catherine and we did really want the same things. Um, <laughs> Richard's now uh, air singing and just had slightly different ways of going about it. But we did agree on a lot of things and that is obviously the danger with the Twitter debate. We're, we're blessed now with an extra 140 characters with which to confuse ourselves and trip over ourselves and but you just can't have a normal um intelligent thought through conversation on um on twitter um so i will hope to get catherine back on again but yeah we, i mean we, we we agreed in that it is nonsensical to argue against the minimum wage it's what everybody would want but neither of us had an answer as to how we could do that straight away and I made the point that cycling, it's women's cycling is not a sport that is governed by mul- a, a few multimillionaires who are siphoning off money elsewhere and, and greedily storing the money instead of filtering it down through the sport. There just isn't an awful lot of money in the sport at the moment. And the key is to try to work out how to increase that pot of money, first of all, I think, or at least at the same time as then working out how to distribute it in a more even way. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring cycling podcast Femina. And as I mentioned at the start, they produce this Peddlers de Charme t-shirt and jersey that will be available in the new year. Lovely stuff it is too, Arla. You'll be getting your t-shirt very soon. I know you've been waiting for it for a while, <laughs> patiently. Sorry. You've calmed down, I think, a little bit. Are you enjoying my comfortable chair, my new I'm chair? Enjoying, I'm very much your, your um, leather swivel chair. It's yeah, nice, it's isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I've got the comfy one this time. Um, yes, yes, I have calmed down. I, yeah. I apologise. We established in the box. break there that we are, there is, we're blazing a trail here because we have equal pay in the second <laughs> podcast, Femina. <laughs> Equal cups of tea. <laughs> Everything's equal, though you get a nicer chair. <laughs> Peddlers to Charm, then. Who was our Peddlers to Charm? We, we ran a Twitter poll mm. for the year. And, uh, well, Tiffany Cromwell insisted that Chantal Black be on it. That was her nomination. Mm. Um, Corin Rivera was on it, a very worthy uh, nominee. Who did uh, you vote for? Did you vote? Um, who else was on it? Cassia Nivea Doma was on it. Mm-hmm. And Annemiek van Vluten. Now, Anna van der Breggen wasn't on it, and she probably should have been on it. But, you know, Peddlers de Charme, Peddler de Charme. How did I miss that, miss that Anna van der Breggen wasn't on it? Counter, you sent me the list of contenders. She it, was definitely it's on It's supposed it. to be counterintuitive, isn't it? Okay. You know, it's not, not supposed to be the obvious one. However, True. the obvious one did win in the, in the <laughs> event. Annemiek van Vluten, can't really argue with that. No, so, she would have been mine, to be yeah. fair, even with... Anna van der Breggen's brilliance. I think Annemiek van Vluten, definitely. She she personifies, I think, what we would like peddlers to sh- de charme to represent. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, uh, there were some nice moments, weren't there? The World Championships after the time trial mm-hmm. when she greeted her mother and, and, you know, emotional. And after what happened to her in Rio, et cetera, that was kind of the shadow from which she was coming back, I guess. And, and yeah, we'll get a T-shirt to her. I'm sure she'll be thrilled. <laughs> I think that'll be the the cherry on her Christmas cake. Quite honestly, mm. what a wonderful year she's had! And to top that off, she's got a cotton T-shirt. 
But thanks, Corn Rivera, for campaigning <laughs> on your own behalf. That was nice to see. Mm. A bit of engagement there. Yeah. It didn't quite work, but um, maybe next year. Yeah. So anyway, we'll get a T-shirt to, to Annemiek van Vluten. As I say, you can get the T-shirts at thecyclingpodcast.com if you go to the shop. Great Christmas present, obviously. We have, uh, I mentioned at this point, we've got a book coming out in oh, yeah, March the 1st next year, a uh, journey through the cycling year. It's a cycling podcast book, but Orla, you've got a chapter in there um, on La Course. And there's also a chapter in there by Ashley Moolman Passio, mm-hmm. uh, the South African writer who's written about a, a tale of two tours, about the Giro Rosa and the women's tour. Just very interesting to compare those two races and how each sort of symbolizes a, a different cycling culture. So... So yeah, the book will be available March the 1st next year and we're excited about that. And I can't we'll wait be... to read everybody else's yeah. chapters actually because yeah. you've been so sort of consumed in your own. It'll be lovely to read it all together. Mm, it's good. I think it's good read. But yeah, that was a lot of fun to work on. It's sort of diary style a lot mm. of it. Now Orla, you have spoken to Erwin Jansen of the Dolman's Landscaping Group. He's a the director there and they of course are with Bulls sponsor, the Bulls Dolman's women's professional team the top team in women's cycling with a real galaxy of stars Anna van der Breggen Lizzie Dagnan the new world champion Chantal Black of course Megan Garnier and it was very interesting to hear what he had to say about their involvement with the team and about women's cycling in general here he is Erwin Jansen so talk to me about the start of the team then tell me how it all started out yeah, we start uh, around six years ago and then uh, as a small Dutch team um, and we only uh, looked for Dutch uh, young talents. Eh? So girls, they make the step from the juniors to the women uh, elite. Yeah, we did it two years. It was really good and, and we race uh, a lot and we, we, we give them a, a nice professional platform, but we never win a race. And so after after two years, I thought, OK, now I want to win some races. So and then, uh, yeah, I, I looked for new, uh, new big sponsors and I found in Bulls uh, a good uh, companion. And uh, yeah, then we make a plan for four years. And in that four years, uh, we want to grow to the top three of the world. Uh, as a team and of course uh, win the world tour races so step by step uh, we grow of course we have we have a nice budget and now uh, we are with a budget i think with the top three of, of the women's cycling but it's of course not only the the money uh, because uh, what you see is uh, we have a lot of uh, girls they start in our team uh, for example lizzie she started and she was the number 12 of the of the UCI ranking, and then she grew in our team to the number one, and she won all, eh, became world champion, etc., etc. Megan Garnier, she starts in our team at the number 36, yeah, and last year uh, she won a lot, and yeah, she became the number one of the world. She won the she won the, the Giro. So yeah, I think what we do very good is uh, we we have a strong management, and we have a uh, very good Danny Stam, eh, the team uh, director sportif. I think what we do uh, is a kind of a familiar, uh, familiar uh, atmosphere. Uh, the girls like to race, and I think yeah, we arrange everything very good, uh, so they feel okay. And then you see step by step that the atmosphere is growing, and yeah, they they want to fight for each other. Uh. So you say it's not just the money. I mean that must be a big factor. But is there one single factor that contributes most to your professionalism as a team? If it's not money, or it may be. Of course, uh, it's a combination uh, for money, but you have to, you have to use the money on the good way. Uh, I think we do that good, and uh, there are teams with the same budget, but they are on the ranking uh, on four or on six or on five. So, yeah, it's I think it's from us um, the feeling we 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 put in the team, uh, and you see also for the girls how uh, they like it when. Uh, we have also a lot of sponsors who come and watch it. So they feel it's a kind of uh, yeah, really pretty atmosphere uh, to make their goals. And not only for, okay, there is a big multinational who is the sponsor and uh, they only watch how many minutes are we on television, etc., etc. So the passion for the sports, what is also uh, from my side, I think that's really important. Uh, I train sometimes with the girls and yeah, they like it. So we do crazy things. Last December we went out of season to a ski uh, holiday and they told her are you crazy we go skiing and from the break uh, she never made skiing at Rabobank it was in the contract uh, and we said okay we go ski it's uh, three months before 
okay, easy on. And then we, we did it and it was a really great team uh, building session. So I think that's one of our successes. I wanted to ask about the skiing in yeah. particular, because that was one thing that in any professional team, never no. mind cycling, yeah. it would be the probably one of the absolute no-nos. You yes. are not allowed yeah. yes. to put your feet onto a pair of skis yeah. while you are in a contract with us. Were you not terrified that would go wrong or was the risk outweighed by the knowledge that it would bring the girls together? Of course, uh, we thought, for, OK, when there is happening something, uh, we come in the newspapers and they tell us, from, uh, are you crazy what you're doing? But yeah, we really thought about it and chose for it and we thought, for, OK, this is such an important team-building session on the beginning of the season with new riders because otherwise they start and they go into a training camp. They are directly in a formal position. And they directly train, looked, watched each other. And now we were skiing and uh, yeah, we made fun and uh, we go out and drink two days. And it was great. And everybody knows each other then. And yeah, you start the season in a very different way. So for you, why women cycling? Why not men cycling? Why not any other sport? Yeah, okay. I, I, it was, uh, I started uh, 12 years ago as a co-sponsor in another team in women's cycling. And okay, uh, I saw the evolution of the sports. Yeah, and I saw the possibilities of the sports. And yeah, in men's cycling... Uh, yeah, okay, that's of course uh, a bridge far, uh, much far. And also with the budget, of course. Uh, if you look, we have a budget uh, all in from around 2 million. And yeah, look to Sky, they have 25 or 30 million. But I see with that budget, we can do a lot in the evolution of women's cycling. And that gives me a much better feeling than becoming a co sponsor uh, at a men's team. Which of the teams in the women's peloton do you think share that vision with you? Which of the teams that you're most impressed by in terms of their professionalism, in terms of how they want to advance this the sport? Yeah, you see, the last years, of course, uh, they are, they are, the, the women's cycling is growing and growing. Eh? You can you can look when three years ago when we had that bus and eh? it was in women's cycling was really. Ah, okay, impressive or, or really uh, professional. And now if you look Sunweb and uh, uh, the, the, the team of uh, Voss, uh, 3WM and also uh, Lotto, they are... Uh, so you see that in general the, the women's cycling is growing. But yeah, I have a lot of respect now how Sunweb uh, is, uh, is doing uh, their job. Uh, really professional, okay, they are combined with the men. Uh, and that's, of course, also, I think, pretty unique, what we do. Uh, we are the only top women's cycling team who is not linked on a men's team. Okay, and Wiggle, of course, then also. Wiggle is also a very nice team, but I think the way we do it is uh, really special. Would you like to reverse the model and uh, maybe one day start a men's team to go alongside the women's? <laughs> no, I have not that ambition. I have not that ambition. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for sponsoring the cycling podcast Femina. And a reminder that you can get 20% off all your Science in Sport products at scienceinsport.com with the code CPAUG20. Just enter that at the checkout, CPAUG20. Twenty And before the break, we heard from Erwin Jansen of the Dolmans Landscaping Group, one half, of course, of the Bulls Dolmans professional team. Uh, really interesting. I, you know, I haven't heard him speak before. And, you know, the, the thought that, that's gone into the team, um, the, the level of professionalism, the, the, the passion as well that really comes across is great to hear. Yeah, and he seems, you know, quite involved in it um, in a hands-on way as well as emotionally. I mean, he runs a, a garden landscaping business, you know, but he's, he's obviously completely immersed himself into this. Um, we saw him at the RDN Classics hanging around the bus and being with the team and they've just impressed so much haven't they I mean in 2016 they were so dominant absolutely untouchable by the looks of it and what's brilliant in 2017 is that they topped the rankings once again but they weren't untouchable anymore and they did they weren't as dominant anymore and Sunweb who, who were second in the rankings um, had such a great year and if you look at some of the transfers now um, I think Canyon Shram are looking really exciting for next year with um, the second barn sister with um, Cassia Novodoma and I think it just it's a really really um, healthy exciting time when you see that 
Bowles Dolmens haven't dropped their level, but other teams have risen up to be at their level, and that's brilliant. And, you know, a lot of his successes were down to one rider, Anna van der Breggen, who joined the team this year. So, you know, it suggests that things are more fluid than they used to be in, in women's cycling. And, and that's true of the transfer market as well. I think we mentioned this before, but that's been really a new, a new phenomenon uh, to see so much movement and, and, you know, sideways movements, riders you know, moving sort of, you know, Kanye Shram to wiggle high five in mm. the case of Lisa Brenner, for example, who I met actually at uh, the WNT get together. She was there because she's become quite friendly with the owner of the team, Claude's son. So I spoke to her and we'll hear that interview in a future episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina. I, I like the idea of the uh, the skiing as well. I might mm. try and wangle a... A, 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 <laughs> a press a, invite. A ski, a ski holiday <laughs> with Bulls Dolmans. Yeah, because they're doing it again this year, actually. And I spoke to um, um, Emma Wade, who's the agent of uh, Lizzie Dagnan, and she was a little bit terrified that anything would go wrong at this at this ski trip, as I guess um, anyone involved in the team would be. But I think that's brilliant. And it's, it's great that they're having fun. And, you know, that kind of thing works so well in terms of building a team together so it's good that they're enjoying it that they're having fun with it and that um, remembering what it's all about really well speaking of team building Orla WNT is a team that we featured on the, on the podcast before because an old friend of mine Graham Hurd who's a former Scottish national coach is this, the director there this was his first season running the team really the team's been around for a few years but it's developed from a club team into a professional team and it's very much a development team a lot of uh, young riders there now I was invited to their team get together a few weeks ago. I was uh, I didn't really study the details. I'm not sure I was given all the details about exactly where I was going, but I flew to Munich and was picked up in Munich and uh bundled into a car. <laughs> bundled. <laughs> it's a very sinister. No, no. You were whisked was, away was, earlier, now you were bundled into the car. Away. <laughs> I was whisked away two hours in the direction of Austria and we we're right on the border of Austria. The the company is based in Kempton which sounds like it should be in England. In England, yeah. But it's Kemp 10, mm. and it's in the in Bavaria, which is actually Lisa Brenner's hometown. Ah. That's how she's got to know Claude Sun, the managing director of WNT. Now, WNT make tools, and uh, it's quite a, an impressive company. They're heavily involved in the bike industry through the, the precision tools that they make, and uh, they the factory there and, you know, huge setup. I mean, really a very big company indeed. We'll hear a little bit about it from Claude's son, who, as I say, is the is MD, and the team is very much his passion project. He's from Brittany, in fact, and used to ride in the company of Bernardino um, mm. as a youngster and raced as well and, and was quite serious about it before he studied engineering and has ended up running this big company. And, you know, interesting, like Bulls Dolmas, that they've chosen to, to back women's cycling, as well as the team, they sponsor quite a lot of the big races, the Madrid Challenge, Grand Prix Plouet, which is obviously his, his home race mm -hmm. as well. So anyway, I went over there and met the team, met a lot of the riders. Eileen Rowe uh, is somebody who a lot of people in Britain will know. She's been British Criterium champion a few times, a, a top rider, rode for Wiggle High Five a couple of years ago. We'll hear a little bit from her. We'll hear from Claude Sun, from Graham Hurd, from a couple of the other writers. We'll hear from Lynn Tutenberg, who is only 19 years old. Now, her name will be very familiar because she is the niece of Ina Yoko Tutenberg, one of the real pioneers of women's cycling, won lots of very big races. And she's really part of a cycling family. Her grandfather is a coach. Her father was a, a professional and her uncle was a professional as well, who rode for Sven Tutenberg, rode for Telecom. And Lars Tutenberg rode for various teams, but also has, has sort of found his niche more in, in management, worked as a technical director for HTC Columbia and Green Edge. He's just recently been appointed performance director for Bora Hansgrove, P uh, Peter Sagan's team. So she is steeped in cycling. And I was just looking her up yesterday, Lynn Tutenberg, and um, she's a real character. But I found this article from 2012 on Clara Hughes's website, she was a former teammate of Ina uh, Tutenberg. And there are pictures here of her going for a ride with Ina and her nephew and niece tagging along. There is Lynn Tutenberg, age 12, and they did a 70-kilometre ride. <laughs> at the and age of 12. It, at the age of, of 12. And it's it's absolutely brilliant. So I look that up, clara-hughes.com. Is that her or her nephew in the HTC? They're both jersey? well. They're both in HTC That's kit too because cute. Uh, Ina rode for HTC, of course, as did Clara Hughes. So, yeah, really, really fascinating <laughs> read, and it's it's interesting to see 
how they look then because her brother, uh, Lynn's brother, is still racing as well, as far as I can make it. Tim Tutenberg, he's a couple of years younger than her, so he'll be 17 now. So look out for them, but we'll hear a bit from her as well later on in this clip. Let's hear it now. We were looking for a director sportive who is able to manage a woman team, so this is not my strength, you know. I know the, the, the cycling for men, for women, I think you need a director sportive with a lot of experience of a woman team because they, they ride differently, they, they, they think differently, you, you have to manage the team a little bit differently than the men team. My name is Claude Saint, so my background is cyclist anyway. You were explaining you're not just a sponsor who gives a, a check to a team to, to no. run the team, you actually own the team, the, the riders are employees of the company. I consider them like like all the employees worldwide. They've got a job to do. They have to represent the company. They do it very well. Uh, this is the reason why they have to know how we think on what we expect from them. And then they can transport the company value to the customers. You were showing me some figures earlier about the return that sponsors can get from cycling. Do you feel that it's working for you? Yeah, we, we did a lot of analysis. So... For example, a woman tour, I was always interesting the, from Brückenbauer, from Bora 1 to 10. I asked always another company to make an analysis return of invest. It was 1 to 8, 1 to 10, so it's correct. So, a so it is a very, very nice. It's a very nice. Euro you put in yeah. 10 euros back. Yeah. 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 Or the calculation is uh, what should I do? What should I invest to have the same? Investment See, and support, yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah. So on, on if you come on TV on everything now, we're pro tour cycling. On you've got a positive image, but it's a period of time. You should not go there and say, okay, now I invest one euro, I want ten, ten euro next day. It's not easy. It's, it's a long term. This is plan. A, on on brand awareness take long years, you know. On on this is the reason why say so always step by step or with such team or such a project it takes years you should not go too fast with the size of investment you're making in the women's team what would that get you if you were to put the same amount of money into a men's team i, w- I said i will have to, to double or triple my budget <laughs> first it will be not the same effect on communication for our market for our customers I think women women are more something different in our world it's a male dominated industry yeah and so, and yeah, so having, a a, dom- having a women's team is in, in it's something your fresh yeah. you know what I mean fresh Team has it's a you know it's an international team now for next year ten riders six nationalities that's obviously a deliberate strategy but how do you go about talent spotting and, and selecting riders a lot of them young and, and unproven what are you looking for there's two main main driving factors behind it you know one the team started off as a UK club team and then progressed to UCI level so you're not globalising but you're definitely broadening your your horizons to cover the whole of Europe which not by accident links really well with you know WNT's business activity which is which is Europe wide so you know from a business point of view and, and from a performance point of view it, it makes sense to, to cast your eye wide to look for the kind of riders who you know A have got potential to develop and B fit the company values for WNT you know we we see ourselves as a team you know primarily as a development team not just for products affected by WNT tooling but also for people because it's the project itself is not is not an overnight thing it's it's very much about sustainability and and being stable and basically what we're trying to do is grow a team we're not we're not really motivated by buying one but I think the roster we've ended up with now is is really interesting and it's, it's a really exciting group you know we go from first year senior with Lynn Schuttenberg at one end to 30 years old Lydia Boylan who's a who's a triple Irish champion and now a European medalist on the track so it's, we've basically got a 12 year spread although you know the trend is young we've, we've got a lot of riders early 20s or younger and that's for me that, that gives us us room to develop as a team but also them 
room to develop as people and you know if we have to accept that kind of developmental role and, and actively seek it then ultimately we, we have to accept that riders will be with us for one or two seasons and you know and if they're good and if they progress they, they will get better offers from bigger teams for us that's that's part of the process and it's something that's you know you don't always actively seek it but it's it's success isn't it you know and it's in a different way from just measuring on, on the basis of you know how many good riders you have in your team Natural, are you? Uh, did you know that you had this in you? No, I didn't. I was well scared when I first got on, but now getting into the swing of things, it's just like riding a bike. I can tell that you're you're kind of eager here to get back in, aren't you? We're we're doing a relay thing where we've got our our co-drivers out there, our teammates out there just now, and they do ten minutes, and then hand over for us to do ten minutes. How are you getting on in the race? Um, we were coming second, but Lynn just had a crash, so I think we might have slipped down a few places, but we're doing all right. And otherwise, are you uh, excited for next year and to be here with the team and get to know some of your new teammates? Yeah, we went through the team calendar yesterday and it's actually really exciting. Um, I got on well with all the girls. It's really nice to bunch of girls to race with and train with, so hopefully next year will be really good. I'll let you get your helmet back on. Thank you. <laughs> This is team building. Yeah, it's really team building. I can tell you've been here before. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly all the curve, all the time, everything. <laughs> you, you took me on the inside, but not me into the tires at one point. Did it? Oh, yeah, I'm so did. sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't want to do it, you know, but I did recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so sorry. I'm really so sorry. Who are you impressed by? Eileen Rowe looks very good. Yeah, she's very aggressive. Very aggressive. She, and in the car. She, yeah, she pushed my colleagues out of her back. <laughs> like, like on the bike, you know, exactly like on the bike. You'll see the character exactly this is the same on the race. It's almost a uh, transition time again. Better get my helmet yeah, back okay. on. Yeah, okay. Good luck. <laughs> Austria. Is this bonding you with your teammates? Yeah, I like, really like the team. We are more than like, we are more a family than a team. And yeah, I really like it. Everyone is really nice and we can really work together good and it's great. Even here on the racetrack? Yeah, now it's everyone for themselves a bit. <laughs> You're with uh, Eileen, are you not? Yeah, I'm with Eileen. There's a lot of pressure. It is actually. She's really good. <laughs> I think she had some practice before. <laughs> it's quite competitive. People are taking it quite seriously. Yeah, we are like we are cyclists. So as soon as you tell us it's a competition, we take it seriously, and it is a competition. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lea Lynn Teutenberg and I'm riding for VNT Rotor for cycling. Now, we've just finished go-karting. You were very, very good at go-karting. Yeah, it was a lot of fun and it was really good. You were told off, I think, as a group for driving too dangerously. Yeah, I think it wasn't my fault, but you have to be, like, fighting <laughs> to get your, get your way. <laughs> but it's a new team. You've just, just joined. How... how get together like this how, how, how has it been for you to meet the team meet the get to know the company a bit better and meet, and meet some of your new teammates uh, it was really nice I'm just coming up from juniors and they're all like very nice and really like them so I'm looking forward for the two years and you're the youngest person on the team yeah yeah I am but it's okay I'm going good with that <laughs> uh, you're from a cycling family how do they feel about you becoming a cyclist yourself are they are they very interested in your career? Are they very supportive? Yeah, they support me a lot, but it was not like, okay, you have to do cycling because everyone is doing. Um, I did a lot of different sports before and it was um, they supported me too at this, so they really support me and help me as much as they can. So I say you're the youngest person on the team. How does it feel to, to step into a, like a proper professional team and, and 
what what are you looking forward to next year in particular? Um, yeah, I'm really proud of riding for a pole team next year, and I think I can learn a lot from the others because they more have more knowledge. Um, so I'm really looking forward for that. Your aunt is a real you know, sort of legend, pioneer, I suppose, in women's cycling. Does she give you a lot of advice? Yeah, I talk to her a lot and ask her if I have any questions and she's helping me very good. Are you a similar kind of rider to her? No, definitely not. She was a sprinter and I'm really bad at sprinting, so... When Claude talks about how much turnover this company actually makes, it's actually quite scary for a, a privately owned company. So it's nice to have a company that's doing so well, that's buying a women's team. Reassuring. But what's it like though when you walk around the offices and you see how visible the team is? You know, there are pictures up, the calendars up. You get a sense that the team really means quite a lot to the company. It does, yeah. Um, they have, like you said, calendars nearly in every single room in the factory. And like Claude said, it is WNT that's actually your employer, you're part of the company. It's not just the team is part of the company, and, and he says that you are representing the company, not just the cycling team. So. It's different, there isn't anything else that's out there. So people go to work and look at pictures of you. Quite scary thought, isn't it? <laughs> uh, how, how have you enjoyed the, being part of the team this year? You know Graham heard well, obviously, and Katie, there's a sort of Scottish contingent in the team. How have you enjoyed being part of it? This, this year's been really refreshing. I mean, women's cycling is becoming a stronger uh, state um, of affair. So this year was quite good for reassurance that the team actually has money for investment. It's not just a one-year deal. Like, Claude wants to make this team a development, so it's nice to be involved in something that will progress and hopefully bring the younger riders on that we've signed for next year to try and help them develop and launch them into the, the bigger category races. Eileen, we've, we've got a signed... Well, it's not signed yet, but I'm going to get you to sign it. Eileen Rowe National Champions jersey to give away to a lucky listener. Right. We'll need to think of a question. What question would, should we set them? I've really put you on the spot here, but... <laughs> the Richard, you can't do that. You need to give me some sort of a... I'm giving you time now. Your brain should be, you your brain should be working now. <laughs> your, your brain should be working now. So you listeners know Richard is actually sitting with a mic right below me and I have no time whatsoever to come up with a question and he's oh, just sitting there oh, waiting. Oh, <laughs> You can Come do it. on. You can do it. So there is a song that I get sung to me every time that somebody realizes what my name is and I've never heard it before. Richard actually started singing that song to me and it's the first time I'd ever heard this song being sung. Um, so I would like to use listeners to get in contact to win this competition of the jersey and I'd like to know what song did Richard sing to me when he came here to do this interview. <laughs> So that was Eileen Rowe playing us out there. Eileen Rowe. Um, I mentioned Katie, Katie Archibald, that is, of course, who's moving on to Wiggle High Five. I think Katie Archibald will miss Eileen Rowe because she's been a, a great teammate for her this year. Very, very capable bike rider, really, hand, as, as in the go-kart, you know, <laughs> handles herself very well in a bunch. A very skillful rider. The, the go-karting was a quite a sobering experience for me but it was it was very was it grinding Richard? it was it was very grounding it, quite literally um but it was it was tell us where you came oh oh i, I was humili- last, humiliated it was last, yeah it? yeah out of how many oh well however many there were <laughs> does, does it matter Who cares? last is last does it matter but the the thing about it was that i mentioned this in in our other podcast but the the, the team building it, it's a bit of a cliche and a, and, it's, and it's sort of mocked a little bit the idea of you know companies or teams doing these activities but when you go there and you take part in it you you, you observe it it's very very effective of course i mean lynn uh, tutenberg there you know she's the youngest rider on the team new to the team 19 years old just turned senior or turning senior and you know i saw her with the, the group and she was quite you know understandably reserved and and just slowly getting to know people after the go-karting it was 
the situation was transformed. You know, she was an accepted member of the team because she was extremely good. Mm. Her and Eileen were the were the best go karters, and and it had really altered the dynamics of the group in a very positive way. That was and fun it sounded to watch. like it was great fun as well. It was, you know, well, people was, having fun together just I, brings them together. I didn't really have fun, but they, they had fun, and that, and that was the main thing. <laughs> um, Let's face it; it wasn't all about you. But I, <laughs> but <laughs> I. There's a bit of an edge to that, comment, <laughs> um, but the the uh, better at not being invited. The, no, not me. <laughs> the, the, as a German speaker, you'd have as a German speaker, uh, you'd yeah, have got on very well there. Yeah. The other thing was it's a just gesprochen, oder? No, <laughs> sure. But you know, going to the factory and the offices and seeing the setup there and and having it, you know, I went with the riders on a tour of all that, which was given by Claude, and and then going into the offices and seeing how visible the team is. There are bikes, there are jerseys everywhere, there are pictures, calendars of the team. They're very, very visible, and for the riders, that must have felt really quite nice mm. to f- really feel part of the company and that, that they're really being backed and supported by this this big company. And you know what as well, that's the first time I've heard anybody quantify the return on women's cycling. One to eight, one to ten, that's more than I thought it would be actually. That's quite encouraging, isn't it? I don't it? know how you measure that really, but... Um, well, I guess they've got, they must have measures though, sure. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And they're, they're still quite new to it at this level. They're building up, they're a, you know, they're a small team. They're not mm. one of the top teams at all. But they certainly have aspirations to to develop and, as Graham Hurd said, to develop some top young riders as well. So uh, exciting times for WNT and thanks very much to them for having me there. Eileen did mention the uh, competition. Mm. What was the song that I Can sang? I guess? No. Can Michelle, I get... no. Yeah. my very, bell. Very. <laughs> nope. Um, <laughs> but do uh, write in, email Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com, send us a Facebook message, send us a Twitter message. We'll gather all these and pull a name out of the hat. In fact, we'll pull two names out of the hat because I've got two oh. signed gilets. I hadn't actually pulled out the bag when I said it was a jersey. I didn't realise it's a gilet. So two British champions gilets. And I've actually got lots of other WNT kit to give away as prizes. We've got Katie Archibald Rainbow Skin Suit, World mm-hmm. Championship Skin Suit with, with her name on it. And it's really quite special. Got world champion, you know, rainbow banded track mitts and overshoes and other team jerseys and so on. Got quite a lot of stuff. They're to, very cool, I have to, to say, away. especially the rainbow very, banded very nice ones. Indeed. They're very cool. Yeah. So if you want to win some of that, we thought we would ask you to tell us what has been your favourite moment of the Cycling Podcast Femina in 2017 and why tell us this, this helps us as well this is, yeah, exactly. this is kind of market exactly. research but I'm guessing my earlier um, stand in my soapbox won't be one of them oh, I'm know. sure that'll be up there <laughs> um, but yeah tell us tell us um, what you've enjoyed and why and we'll we'll pick out some of our favourites and send them send them some prizes maybe mm. chuck in a Peddlers to Charm t-shirt for somebody as well oh, yeah. and I'm going to try and you've, you're flicking it, through a book there Orla that I've I've got because I helped crowdfund a, a book called The Road Book 2017 and it is a, a photographic book about the year in women's cycling. And, and it is absolutely it's beautiful. beautiful. It's so well done. I love it. Velo Focus. Gonna get one. Let me have a quick look at it, please, Orla. It. Um, um, just while you're doing that, if people want to maybe give us their T-shirt sizes with their entries in case we do throw in a few Peddlers de Charme T-shirts. Good idea. That's a very good idea. They're more likely to wear them, really, if, it, if they fit. We've given a few ill-fitting T-shirts over the years. It's not very attractive. Yeah, the, the book is um, the work of Balant Havas, who I know quite well, and Sean Robinson, and uh, they, they cover women's cycling very closely. So it really is the year in women's cycling, and it's, it's very beautiful. It's a gem. Um, so yeah, look out for that. Um, maybe we'll try and get a copy of that for a future episode to give away as a prize if you're listening, Balant. I think he does <laughs> listen, so that'd be nice. Anyway, that's probably all for this month, Orla. And this year. And this year. Well, oh. we'd like to say thank you very much to yeah. everybody who's listened this year. It has been a great, it's our second year of the Second mm-hmm. Podcast Feminine, our first full calendar year. Yeah. And the audience really has gone up a lot this year. It's doubled, really. So there's a lot of you listening and more and more people, hopefully, like us, understanding and learning more about women's cycling as, as we, we go. go yeah. So that's been a lot of fun. What's been your highlight this year, Orla? I mean, we've, oh. we've had a few, few good moments. I mean, I think my highlights are probably fairly obvious in that they're the races that I've been to. And I think that's probably a fairly good indicator to anyone who is interested in cycling. Go along and watch a few races because the 
passion you develop for it and the excitement that you get from it is so much more intense when you go to any of the races. So for me, Flesh Malone, the Women's Tour and Isawa. Probably Isawa was a standout for me and that just because it was a beautiful day. It was a wonderful race. It was a majestic performance by Annemiek van Vluten and I just loved all of that, really. What was I, yours? I, yeah, I mean, all, all of those things I enjoyed hugely. I enjoyed the women's tour in particular and their day in the, day in the team car. That was Mm-mm. good. I also enjoyed our event with Lizzie Dagnan yeah, in Leeds. Course. That was good, especially the crowd. You know, the, it was she was on her home patch and a lot of kids in the audience and that was nice to see uh, and it was nice to see them and the way that they responded to her and the, through the questions and so on that was that was really nice actually one of one of my highlights was a question from that night and it was the little girl asking Lizzie about her pearl earrings and why she wasn't wearing them anymore and I just loved the insight into that little girl's mind and, and the way that she clearly watches Lizzie and pays attention to every little detail and I love now that we've got female cyclists who um, little girls can look to in that way and just idolise, I guess. You know, Lizzie was that little girl's idol, so that probably actually was my standout moment after all that. That's what kind of, yeah, what I enjoyed about finding that old article about Lynn Tutenberg, mm-hmm. and, you know, 12 year old, and she's carried on on that path. You know, and now she's a professional rider. That's great to see. I enjoyed them meeting and chatting properly to Tiffany Cromwell yeah, yeah. as well in Monaco because I thought we got a lot out of her we, we were on a sort of time limit and we were watching the <laughs> clock a bit and, and it gave it a sort of intensity mm-hmm. I think and she really interesting and we'll try and do more with Tiffany I think yeah she's year. so generous with her experience and her thoughts I thought she was brilliant who can forget also the audio diary that Alexis Ryan kept for us at the Tour of California which was a friend special this year she was a natural at that and uh that was, I really enjoyed that. So that Maybe was good fun. Maybe do more of those next year. Absolutely. Well, we've got plans to, mm. we've really, I mean, it has, I'd say, been a really good year. Better than we could have imagined, I think. And certainly in terms of the audience, we're not that far behind our regular weekly podcast, which is wonderful. And we want to expand next year. That will be subject, obviously, to securing a bit of additional funding and so on. But we're working on that. And we want to expand, not not to make it more regular than monthly, but to add additional episodes around the big races. So we would love to, for example, do daily podcasts from the Women's Tour, mm-hmm. as an example. That's that's an aspiration. We'll try and make it happen next year, but we, we're certainly working on, on expanding it next year. The audience is clearly there and the material is certainly there. So And, and you just get so much more stories really when you're at the races as well don't you so I think in terms of what you were saying and bringing the audience along with us and learning more as we go I think that's the best way to do it so hopefully for anyone who can't make it to any of the races if we can bring them on our little journey that would be lovely for real well we better we're, 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 off, we're off in for for a, for a bit of cycling podcast dinner tonight Orla mm, bit of scram you're, yeah. you're making tiramisu I believe I'm making tiramisu for dessert Lionel is making cassoulet and Richard is making puffs of air to go by what I saw coming out of the oven earlier <laughs> tiny little fragments of something that might just about they're going to look quite some part was, of your mouth that was an experimental round <laughs> uh, they'll look more impressive starters a bit for later on. Mm. leprechauns Fair. yeah yeah. Elves, that's what I'm it, yeah, telling you. Yeah, you left you, them out right, for Santa's mo- elves. You laugh now, <laughs> but we'll we'll see, we'll see. Anyway, that'll be fun. We should wish everybody a Merry Christmas. We should. Merry Christmas, and everyone, we'll, we'll from the bottom the of our year. hearts. Yes. Enjoy. I love Christmas. I hope everyone has a lovely one, truly. Thank you, Orla. Thank you, Richard. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004.